Um, so I'm going to talk about why we care about this, all the conversations of the morning. And um, Andrew's right. I started trying to ask these questions about 300 years ago, <laughs> maybe a little longer, or that's what it feels like. Looking good. <laughs> good. <laughs> but um, I, I realized that there were some things that changed everything else. Based on the discussion of this morning, which brought up climate change, from my point of view, there are two things that change everything else about our future. One is climate change, and one is longevity. And how we decide the course on each of them is going to decide our collective future. That's a flat-footed statement, um, but in the limited time I have, I can tell you that that's based on a lot of science. So what I, I think is very critical, to, if there are things that change everything, to be sure we're clear about what we're shooting for. So I, I think what I'd like to offer to you is a perspective that the last several decades of science enable us to have at this point, which is that the creation of longer lives, which we have created as societies based on our investments over the last hundred years, we've created that, is now the design challenge of the 21st century. And in fact, we as individuals are, the opportunities of that design challenge are inextricably linked to our collective agreement about how we will do this, hence the title of the talk, and I'm going to offer you a proposition that the opportunities of longer lives are as yet untapped. So we've already been talking all morning about the fact that we're in the midst of a demographic revolution. We've added 30 years to human life expectancy, easy to say now, but rather a breathtaking accomplishment, never before accomplished in the history of the world. Um, in fact, we've added a whole new stage to human life. Um, people are going to be living a third of their lives after what we now call re retirement age. And we are at the moment this year where the, there is a crossover in terms of there being more people 65 and older in the world than there are children under the age of five. All of these things are unprecedented in the history of the world. And in fact, we have more people 65 and older alive right now than ever lived if you add up all the eons of human existence together. So what's the sum impact to that? I'll go back to a point that Andrew made this morning, which is that if more people live longer, you shift the age distribution in a population and you start having a higher proportion of the population living <laughs> at older ages, and here you see the percentages for the UK on the right and the US on the left. For the present, um, a little over 16 and 17% of our populations are 65 and older, but projected out to 2050, conservatively, it's going to go up to a quarter of our populations, a fifth to a quarter. Now, how did we get there? It's very important to remember that we did this. In fact, this is the great success of investments societies have made in the 20th century. About three quarters of this success is attributed to public health and healthier environments and living conditions. A quarter is from improvements in education, poverty alleviation, and more recently medical care. So we did this in the last century, and the question is, with these transformative changes so that we have a set of situations that we never had before, um, highly disruptive, we can't predict from our past what the future should be. It's a nonlinear proposition where the past may not get us where we optimistically would like to go. Now, Demographers and economists say that we've gone around the world, we're in, we've gone through two stages of population evolution. One was the first demographic dividend when we moved from agrarian societies 
to more uh, industrial societies, saw a decreased infant and child mortality, decline in the number of children born to a woman, which has decreased fertility, and, you, and because of improvements in sanitation and environment and living conditions, start to see children surviving to adulthood. That's the first demographic dividend. The second de demographic dividend, which is what demographers say almost every country of the world is now in, is one where we continue to live longer. Um, in fact, people start to age. We see a labor supply greater than the dependent population of children. And the age structure starts to change in dramatic ways. And for societies where the young people who are now of working age are thriving, and have jobs and education that is the economic driver of a successful society. Thus far, what we've said is that that's as good as it gets. This, we're, in, we're at the tail end in the west of the second demographic dividend. And the key benefit that we're getting out of this one is that people save more as they live longer. I'm going to posit to you that we could create a third demographic dividend. And I'll come back to that. But uh, thus far, demographers say we, we have reached our apex. So let's think about the proposition that we've created a new stage of human life. Um, somebody this morning said what we've done is we haven't necessarily made old age longer. We've injected a new stage we never saw before. Um, and I think the question, the proposition is, can this be good? Um, the narrative over the last 30 years or so, particularly in the US, I can say, has been that this is a disaster for everybody. Um, but that's an untested question. Um, and if it could be good, what would good be? Uh, we've created this. How do we turn this? Is there a way to turn this success into a victory for individuals, for families, for communities, and for society? And what would we have to do to do that? And most important is the narrative that more, which we heard this morning, um, that more older people essentially take the food out of the mouths of the young. Is that accurate? Or does it have to be? So what do we do? Um, well, the first stage, I think, of the science was to test whether the myths that many of our policies of the last century are built on are accurate. And I would say that in the main, they have been debunked over the last 20 to 30 years. Here are some of them. Um, one, uh, around aging societies, it, is that older people don't contribute to society, to their families, to their communities. They're not productive. They're tech resistant and ignorant. Um, no assets, not creative. You can put a check mark next to debunked. Um, older people are financial dependents. If you look at all the data about which way money flows across generations, um, debunked. The biggest public problems facing an aging society stem from the cost of social protections. I don't think that's accurate. Aging mainly impacts the old. We've been talking all day about the fact that this is a life course proposition. And in fact, if we have more old people, we need to think about how to make that good for all ages. And the science would tell us we may be able to figure that one out. And then this proposition that in an aging society, the young and old are inevitably pitted against each other ignores the facts and ignores human need, which is that we need each other across generations. And young people are not ready to throw older people under the bus, except maybe for the OK Boomer movement at the moment. Um, and, and certainly in the US, policymakers have taken either or propositions of that, and Andrew will correct me if I get this wrong, but that we either invest in young people or old people. We can't do both. And there's no synergy. Um, and finally, there's the lump of labor fallacy, which is a fallacy that jobs for old people take jobs away from the young. Not true. So we have, over the last 20 to 30 years, debunked all of these things. Um, 
So let's try and wipe the slate clean. But then there's another set of facts. One of the challenges we have, if you look around us, is that our, it's very clear that our current approaches to the present, to aging, were designed for a different world. They were designed in the main, main when life expectancy was 47, 100 years ago. They were not designed for the disruptive transformational opportunity we have in front of us. And um, in particular, what we haven't appreciated was something that um, Tina was saying this morning, which is that we have learned from science what everybody has talked about today, which is that health is malleable. 30 years ago, that was an argument among scientists. Could we prevent disease? Could we pre would prevention work in the older ages? Would it matter? Would people do it? Would physicians prescribe it? All of these were questions. Fast forward, we know a lot of things now that we have not designed for, as you said earlier. We know that prevention works and matters at every age and stage of life. We know that health is malleable. And in fact, that there are subsets of society who are aging with health, and that in those subsets, health span is approximating life expectancy. So we know it's possible. Um, we know that it requires a number of things, which I'll come to in a moment, but we are not yet designed to enact what the science says. Um, certainly in terms of the way we've carved out our lives, um, we, and this is a slide from last year's speaker, Laura Carstensen, you know, we've set life up so that we have three stages. We go to work, we go to school for an unbelievable amount of time, we work for an equal amount of time, and then we retire now for the same amount of time, for a third of our years. Um, and that is actually leaving us with the fact that we never designed that third stage, which in the US is fondly called a rollless roll. Role. Um, so we're living a new stage of life without an expectation of what this could mean, and with a lot of negative inference about it being a drain on society. So, if we wipe the slate clean with the myths we've debunked, with what the science says might be possible, could we, uh, using Andrew and his colleagues' phrase, design for a hundred year life if we use the evidence of what could be aligned with what would be great? Um, I, I do believe this is the design opportunity of the 21st century. Um, and it's really for my 20 and 30 year old students to make the most of it because it's about designing for their lives because by the time a society finishes this, our 20 year old students are gonna be ready to use it at 60. Um, so let's start first with what people want. Um, certainly security, health across their lives, um, for many people, the right environment to age in place, cohesion and connection, meaning and purpose and staying engaged. If you, all of the science that's looked at what people want, these are the essential elements of uh, a meaningful and desirable full and long life. Um, if you look at the, we, in the, I'm a member of the Aging Society Network, which is a small think tank, which is of uh, American and European scientists who have been meeting for the last um, almost 15 years with the goal of trying to think about how societies prepare for longer lives. And if you look at, we've created an index, um, which you're welcome to argue with, but at least for a starting point, that looks at five categories of essential elements of a society that need to be built and, and strengthened for successfully aging societies. 
And ranking the OECD nations along those axes, you see that um, there's a lot of variability for well-being. Perhaps our measures were healthy life expectancy and life satisfaction, productivity and engagement, security, cohesion and equity, all anchor concepts for successful societies. And the US and the UK, I put their ranks out of the OECD uh, total number of 36 countries, um, perform variably along different axes of that matrix. How do we think at a societal level about what the basics are, which are these, and what the opportunities are? Well, one basic, of course, is social protection the critical foundation of a humane and just society that protects people um, with a floor of equitable access to health and well-being and financial security and safety. I'm not going to spend time on that, but it is not to be forgotten because it turns out that that's an essential basis for healthy longevity. But I think that we could, in fact, design over and above that to add the other layers of what it might take to create a third demographic dividend, which I believe we could do. And that requires two key elements. Um, one is um, to recognize these data, which I told you, that health is malleable into the oldest ages. And the second is, if health is the key in the lock, which I believe it is, what that would unlock. Now, what's the evidence on health being malleable? Well, it's clear from the science of the last several decades that half of all chronic diseases are preventable. 50% of cancers are preventable. Um, we know that prevention works to the oldest ages. I mentioned that before. We know that physical activity and nutrition work and are important, as people said this morning, at every age and stage of life. We know that healthier environments matter. Air pollution harms the intellectual development of newborns and children. It also is a risk factor for dementia. Healthy environments matter. And we also know that the sum consequences of health inequities add up as people get older and health trajectories diverge based on a lifetime of experience and exposures. So if we know all of that, um, I think it's quite encouraging if you look at the global data that actually healthy life expectancy um, is increasing globally, and that's the blue here looking from 1990 on the left to 2016 on the right. And globally, the amount in red, which is the years, live, years of life left to live with disability, has remained stable. Now, in a world of healthy longevity, we hope we'll shrink the red part, and the blue will expand much more. But there is cause for optimism. Who do we see? Andrew and I were talking about means versus variance before. Um, these are means, but the truth is much more like the data we heard this morning, that in the same city you can have a 25-year difference in life expectancy and health expectancy on two sides of the same city. That's the variance. So we know that actually now that prevention and health promotion work into the oldest stages. We also know that if we invest all along the life course, that people are positioned to arrive at older age healthy, and that people who arrive at old age healthy are tracked to stay healthy with the right investments after that. Um, so that suggests that we need to think differently about how we deliver health intentionally in a 21st century way so that we have a life course approach to prevention at every age and stage of life so that we're actually investing not just in saving people's lives now, but investing in their health futures at every age and stage of life. And we now know from the science that those investments matter, no matter how old you are. Now, I said, from my point of view, this is the key in the lock to unlock health 
and function are the, uh, is the lock for the, to unlock the opportunities. But um, as was mentioned earlier today, you know, we have to take this evidence if we're going to um, recognize the nonlinear opportunities of the world we're in. We need to take it and rethink how we deliver health in our health systems and in our environments. And certainly, um, I'm going to skip this. Certainly, it's very clear that not only do we need to deliver health care for those who are sick, medical care for those who are sick, tailored medical care when appropriate, but we also dominantly have to deliver health at the level of our populations, our communities, and our society, because much of it um, delivered, can only be delivered in that way. Think safe water, hard for an individual to achieve. Um, think access to healthy and affordable food, hard for an individual to accomplish if there, if there are no grocery stores delivering that at an affordable price in their community. These are the, um, the ability to breathe and not have asthma, very much conditioned on what the environmental conditions are. So this is a shared proposition. These two ways of delivering health are two sides of the health coin, if you will. Um, but health is the product at the intersection of those. So conditioned on health comes the question, why do we want this? We worked really hard over the last 100 years to create this longer life expectancy. What do we want to do with it? Um, and a large gaping hole in our narrative is what the last third of life should entail. Now, just let you reflect on that for a second for yourself. What do you want to do with it? And then I'd like to uh, point out that contrary to our public narrative, what the science now says is that as people get older, they, have, they accrue and develop assets that you'll never see when you're 20. What could those be? In fact, assets that the second demographic dividend never knew about. Let me give you a picture of them. This is the elders, a group of senior statespeople convened by Nelson Mandela 12 years ago. It's one of the youngest organizations in the world. The elders um, are senior statespeople who work together day in and day out to, sh to affect the future of our planet and our countries. Of course, Nelson Mandela is no longer the chair. Mary Robinson is now the chair of the elders. Um, and it has some new members. But that's a pretty inspiring group to look at. When you think about the assets of older age, you know, looking at them, they have a lot to offer that they couldn't have done when they were 20. And in fact, the science backs that up. For all of us, um, we now have the healthiest population of older adults in the history of the world, as, as well as the uh, largest. And we have the best educated population of older people in the history of the world. Perhaps not as educated as I hope, as the generations behind them will be, but certainly a landmark amount of education. And a lived life of accrued knowledge, expertise, and skills combined with some attributes that scientists say align with wisdom. The ability to recognize complex problems, to not avoid them if you think they are important and they matter, to hang in there with the skills to figure out what's going on and how to parse them and how to break them down if you think they matter, and the ability to pull in groups and teams and networks who can together solve them. Older adults also bring actually some socio-emotional attributes which are quite powerful, in, um, which have to do with integrative social reasoning 
and the ability to value subjective as well as objective knowledge and unite decision making around what's important based on both of those. Interestingly, work from Laura Carstensen and others has shown that older adults also have a dominantly positive outlook. Um, despite the curmudgeon of the popular cartoons, that's not the that's not the average of what older adults emerge at. And they have two other attributes which actually are game changing. One is that in fact, as, as Eric and Joan Erickson and other social scientists have said, as people get older, it becomes more and more imperative to know if your time on this earth mattered. If you are going to leave something of enduring value because you were here no matter the size of it. And this is called the urge for generativity, the urge to know that you have made a difference in this world. And in fact, if you blow that up large in your head, you could say, well, older adults are not only the world's only increasing natural resource, but in fact, they have the desire to be the pay it forward stage of life. And in fact, if you study older adults, that's what you see. So we have all of these assets, somewhat unique to getting older, and a deep sense of time urgency for what matters. If it's important, if it will be what matters for the future of the world, of your children, of your grandchildren, the time urgency is huge because you may not be around in 25 years. And then we have the asset of numbers, critical mass with more time. What we haven't done is put that list together and then say, if this is the new natural resource that the world has, and we have a life stage with no roles in it, could the world be better if we thought about how to bring meaning and purpose together with this? Um, this is a question I have been trying to figure out for a couple decades. Um, but the going in proposition is quite interesting because, in fact, most older people feel like they deeply want to have value in the world no matter what their age. They want respect, but they also want to make a difference. They want to have a reason to get up in the morning. And, in fact, people who have no reason to get up in the morning die. That's the easiest way to die. Um, that's an evidence-based statement. And people need structure in their lives. People who have no structure, have no place to go, die. Um, but in fact, over and above that, engagement brings a reason to get up in the morning and the ability to enact the things you care about for the future of those around you. And that's a powerful force, which turns out to be health enhancing as well as death preventing. Um, that's also an evidence-based statement. And in fact, um, if we could think about the opportunity of longer lives in new ways and could say, are there roles that would matter to older people to play? Could we create societal institutions that would enable that at scale? not against all odds, one person at a time? Could we solve problems with the assets that older adults bring that we never could solve before? So the life stage needs and assets of older adults, I believe, I've come to the belief, um, actually, interestingly, offer matches to the very complex and serious issues we have in every society of the world. Um, a need for social connection and cohesion strengthens communities. Needs for roles for, well, that have meaning and purpose and impact, not just meaning, impact. Um, how do we organize for these things? How do, we, how do we benefit from the complex problem solving ability that older adults have and the generative need they have to leave the world better? Um, Interestingly, if we answered that question, we would accomplish something else at the same time, which is that in the US, at least, the 20th century was a very successful experiment in designing in loneliness. 
designing in independence, designing in autonomy, and designing out connection. And men in the US, at least, many of the institutions that form the fabric of social capital in communities that build cohesion are frayed. Um, if we could solve many of these issues together, which I believe we could, loneliness itself is not only a problem for older people who are subjected to loss of social connections, loss of role, loss of family as they get older, but it could solve the deep need of younger generations for connection and cohesion. So with this background, I would like to offer you a proposition that the second demographic dividend is not the full extent of the assets of our longer lives. That we actually could build, envision and build and design a third demographic dividend resulting from a conception of what older adults, a natural resource we never had before, want and need and could bring to our societies in ways that could be transformative and good for all ages. Roles that would utilize the assets of maturity, meet generative needs, in new social institutions that could organize this previously unseen social capital or potential social capital to address the major unmet needs we have. And simultaneously be designed, if we did it right, to increase the well-being of both older adults and society. So uh, I'll end by giving you one example, um, something I've spent a couple of decades on. Um, and that is um, a program now um, led by AARP in the US, in 23 US cities, which I designed and then joined with my partner, Mark Friedman, who was also having similar thoughts to finish, which is now called Experience Core. We designed Experience Core to be a proof of concept not the be all and the end all, but a proof of concept as to whether you could design a new societal institution for a new age that we never saw before that, heart, that, that confers high impact roles for older adults as volunteers in this case. You'll hear more about work in the next session, paid work, but in this case as volunteers to really transform the human capital of older people into social capital that matters in roles that do all the things we need, have impact, build connection and community, improve health of the older adults, and hopefully lay the basis for resolving health disparities. That's a lot to ask of any one thing, but we gave it a crack. Um, so the proof of concept model that we started with in the mid 90s um, is a high intensity volunteer program to place older adults in teams in large numbers in public elementary schools to support the success of children by third, in kindergarten through third grade. Why then? Because if children are failing by third grade, they're tracked to fail for their lives. If you place, we learned, a critical mass of older adults in a school, with training, with defined roles, as volunteers, not unpaid teachers, they can help transform the outcomes for the kids and for the teachers and for the schools and for the communities. And we hid inside of it, I hid inside of it, a health promotion program for the older adults. Because I learned over many years that people don't sign up for physical activity, the ones who need it, and they don't stay. But if you could hide it inside something they wanted to show up for, maybe they would do it. And in fact, it works. So here's one picture of a, a volunteer in a public elementary school in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we have shown over the years that Experience Corps, on top of an excellent educational system, delivers significant improvements in children's school behavior and the school climate in their academic achievement in literacy and math and their learning readiness and enthusiasm for reading and it improves the teacher's sense of efficacy in teaching. Here's another gentleman, I'll point out this gentleman who I, I knew all of these people is wheelchair bound. 
Experience score in schools, based on studies that we've done, um, has high potential for improved teacher retention because they feel like they can finally teach. Um, it has improved the perceptions of older adults by principals, teachers, and the kids. Um, we went school after school after school from, from principals saying, please don't, <laughs> no, to saying, how many more can I have? Um, and anecdotally for the children, for many children, it's the only opportunity they have to interact with people who have actually survived a long life to get a sense of what a life course might look like. So people come for many reasons to volunteer, but in the main, it's because they want to make sure they have left a legacy that endures. Interestingly, uh, recent studies have shown that actually generativity and purpose in older adults changes your brain. So actually, it's associated with not just lower risk of mortality, but lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, lower risk of um, MCI, lower risk of disability, and actually decreased risk of strokes, Kuhner infarcts on brain MRI. So there is a deep connection between how we live our life and what happens in our body, and these studies exemplify that. Um, this is a small sense of what a critical mass of volunteers in a school could look and feel like. These are people who were uniformly sitting at home with nothing to do. One woman said to me, honey, there are just so many times you can clean a closet. <laughs> um, but they went from depressed or depressive to having meaning, purpose, and staying for years. Uh, and in fact, we've shown that as designed, because we designed the health-promoting contents of this program quite carefully, um, we are seeing very important improvements in health through improvements in physical activity, cognitive activity, and social activity designed into the roles the older adults perform as volunteers. And we're seeing everything from improved strength and lower depressive symptoms to, as I showed you in the, uh, just before, Im not just improved pathology in other people's studies, but improved mental function and improved executive function, particularly in people who were normal in, in cognition but low normal to start with. And finally, we see less loneliness because we have a societal institution that's enabling social connection in ways people couldn't find before. Um, working in the trenches with people day in and day out creates social bonds to replace many that were lost, and people report a sense that they have fulfilled their need for generativity. So as I mentioned, Experience Corps is now in 23 U.S. cities under the leadership of AARP, and we have two people here from AARP, so I thank you very much. Um, and it is in several other countries as well. But Mostly, I, I want to point this out because it's, the experience we've had suggests that it is possible to take this proof of principle and design new social roles that harness the assets that older adults have to offer in ways that matter to them, that transform the futures of our kids and of our society, and that actually change what we perceive as the cost-benefit relationship of longer lives. So what's the implication? As I said, I, am, I have become convinced that as you get older, you are, emerge into a pay-it-forward stage of life. We don't have the societal infrastructure, the societal institutions to enable people to have impact at the scale that they would like. And we leave it to each individual to figure out how to do it on complex problems that's not likely to work. Um, so how do we strengthen our collective future in ways that could create a third demographic dividend? We have societies increasingly that are top-heavy with experienced, knowledgeable, altruistic people who care about the future. And we have serious problems where their assets could match what we need. 
We need to think about how to recognize this unprecedented stock of human capital and how we design within our communities at a national level to transform that untapped human capital.